Mutakia P. Good day, relatives out there in cyberspace. Welcome to the um, Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition panel with our um, panelists, our guests today. Um, today, you are um, part of, excuse me, I want to make sure I say some things right. So I'm going to uh, look at a note that I have. Um, so the Native American uh, Boarding School Healing Coalition, I want to talk with you just for a minute about the mission of, of the Boarding School Healing Coalition is to lead in the pursuit and understanding and addressing the ongoing trauma created by the U.S. boarding school policy. Before we begin our day today, we're going to hear a song that our relative and friend Jerry Dearly made specifically for those who've been separated from our families and our communities. It's a song that we use. It's called the Bob Lanage song. It's a song that we use in the ceremony when we welcome our relatives back to the circle. of child removal through adoption and foster care. And we have with us today uh, two panelists who will speak from their experience. But I want us to think about how boarding school really was the uh, first child welfare policy. They didn't call it that, but that was a way to um, interrupt our families and have control over the children. And it really set the precedent for the breakdown of our uh, families at the individual family and, and our communities, our nations as a whole. And when those individuals came out of boarding school, uh, the economic oppression and coming out of, of those institutions with such wounds that we are, are now so aware of as we've been gathering testimony of our relatives um, during this really exceptionally difficult and hard time, um, it children were targeted once again through child removal, through child welfare. 
so much so you all know that we had to have a law passed because 25 to 35% of all our children were, were removed uh, through adoption and foster care. And it was, it really preyed on those families who were so um, trying to heal without resources uh, from what had happened to them. So today we have with us uh, Jim LaBelle. Who, Jim is an Inupic and a, uh, an enrolled member of the native village of Port Graham and a shareholder in the Chugach Alaska Corporation. Jim is a boarding school survivor who attended Mount Edgecombe and Wrangell Institute. He has served on numerous boards and commissions over the years, including the Alaska Federation of Natives and currently serves as the first vice president of the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. Jim retired as a term instructor from the University of Alaska Anchorage in 2011, but he continues to lecture on historical trauma and the emphasis on boarding schools. Jim and his wife, Susan, have three adult children and five grandchildren. Our other panelist is Dakota Hoska. Um, she's an enrolled uh, Oglala from Pine Ridge, the Wounded Knee community. She joined the Denver Art Museum in 2019 as the assistant curator of Native Arts. Previously, she worked as a curator research assistant at the Minneapolis Institute of Art for four years. And during that time, Dakota completed her MA in art history, focusing on Native American art history at the University of St. Thomas, St. Paul, Minnesota, 2019. She also completed two years of the Dakota language classes at the University of Minnesota, 2016, and received her BFA in drawing and painting from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Dakota's curatorial work allows her to pursue her passions of working closely with her native community while being continually surrounded by and learning uh, about beautiful artwork. And I forgot to say that I'm the president of the Native uh, Board of Directors for the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition and will be your moderator today. So <clears throat> we will start, get right into our, our uh, talk. And I'm going to first talk or ask Jim, if you would just please share with us, um, you have uh, you know, about 15 minutes to um, tell us what you want us to hear. What do you want, you know, the highlights of what you want us to know. Uh, we don't, we know that there are many, there could be many boarding school survivors. There could be some people on here learning and listening about these impacts for the first time. So we welcome everyone who is here uh, listening. We ask you to uh, collectively, we can do this regardless of being um, separated physically. We can still spiritually hold Dakota and Jim in a loving, compassionate, supportive uh, space as they share their experience. So Jim, would you please um, tell us about what you want us to know, what you care to tell us about the boarding school experience. And if you could include also, you have an experience with adoption as well. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, my uh, Inupiaq name is Akpayuk, uh, which means fast runner. Of course, uh, when they look at me, I say, yeah, not anymore. <laughs> Uh, but I'd like to welcome all of you on, uh, on this uh, Zoom uh, presentation. I'm from Alaska, of course, uh, but I'm also a boarding school survivor. I attended two BIA boarding schools from 1955 to 1965. Uh, the, I believe the most brutal boarding school in Alaska was a place called Wrangell Institute. And I was there from 1955 to 1961. And it, it was interesting, uh, I was, as I was reflecting back on what I was gonna say today, it occurred to me that uh, it all began with a threat. Uh, the, um, I don't know who the, the officials were back in my mom's day in Fairbanks, Alaska, but she was given uh, 
a choice. Either send your two young boys to Wrangell or boarding school or um, just a moment. <laughs> or send them uh, or uh, put them up for adoption. <clears throat> and um, that's how my mother was forced to make this decision was um, putting us up uh, to boarding school. Um, thinking very, uh, thinking that at least we'd be together in the summer times. Mm -hmm. And that kind of worked out for a while, but there were times when I would return, my younger brother and I would return uh, from boarding school only to, to be met by uh, people, strangers really, that came to get us and say that we were going to be your foster parents for the summer. Mm -hmm. And we had no idea why our mother wasn't there. Uh, I, I, it could have it could have been alcoholism on her part, but again, uh, it's clouded in time. And the, the officials back in those days, uh, and this was territorial Alaska, so we had no. Uh, the federal government just kind of ruled on on everything uh, mm -hmm. about indigenous people up here, and so that is was how it went over the years. Um, some, some summers would be with our mother uh, and then seemed like in uh, arbitrary times we'd be coming back home and, and only to be met with a new strange family that was going to take us in. And um, <clears throat> I think um, one particular, I used to admire or not admire, but I used to wonder how my brothers and sisters in the lower 48 back in time uh, had to uh, go through this process of uh, working for white families in the summertime rather than to go home. Mm -hmm. And um, I, and uh, this, this reflection I was having about today was, I realized that between my junior and senior year, uh, at Mount Eskim, uh, High School. Uh, I was also uh, met at the airport and taken in by a family and worked on a farm in Fairbanks called Kramer's Dairy. And, uh, and I apparently I must have done it without pay or without compensation. Yeah. I was just, I was just a slave. Uh, to that family and to that farm. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know a, a fig about, um, you know, uh, milking cows, herding cows, uh, herding dry stock around, uh, all those things I learned. Um, and and, I, and that, that particular farm happened to be right in the middle of the town of Fairbanks between the town and the University of Alaska, uh, Fairbanks. And that <clears throat> it was kind of a strange summer too, because I, I never saw my mother uh, at all. Uh, my, my dad uh, had passed away when I was very young and um, he was from Wisconsin. He was a, a white guy. Um, so, <clears throat> I want to uh, go a little further. Some of you may not know that, uh, well, may, many of you may not know that I also had three younger uh, brothers and sisters who were adopted out of our family uh, at, at birth. And, um, and it, was, it wasn't until much later I realized that all of us who were born in this hospital in Fairbanks called uh, St. Joseph's Hospital, had an orphanage in the back of the campus, the hospital campus. And so a lot of times, um, as I was learning more about our history, was uh, people from the Catholic Church or from those that they were affiliating with in the adoption world 
would actually tour the uh, birthing center in the hospital looking for candidates uh, to talk their babies out of uh, uh, keeping them. And my mother, uh, and if you have, and you can imagine this scenario where um, women are undergoing such tremendous experiences with birthing, they're weak, they're, um, they're experiencing so many things that I, as a man, cannot ever think of. But can you imagine then that these people would go into these birthing centers and say, and by the way, a lot of these women were drugged up uh, to help them yeah. with, their, with their birthing. And, um, yeah. and so a lot, of, a lot of children got taken that way. And I have two, sis two younger sisters and one younger brother uh, that was taken. And um, my mother always talked about them and she was very tearful. She, I think she was kind of ashamed that how she could have lost those our siblings, mm -hmm. but she didn't want to talk more about it. And I spent the rest of my life trying to find them. And I did. And uh, I'm glad that I did because uh, for one, one person or one sister, uh, I got to know her uh, for at least 10 years before she passed away. Uh, and she had been adopted to a white family in, in uh, Arkansas. And uh, can you imagine all the way from, and they were an Air Force family in Fairbanks, I also an Air Force base. So here they are, you know, thousands of miles away, never know who got them, who got her, what her life was like. Uh, and when we did finally get together, I saw so, so many things about about her and not or her being lost, mm -hmm. not knowing who she was, yeah. uh, and but at the same time so grateful she found family uh, up there. So there was all those mixed emotions that she was experiencing. Uh, I had a younger brother who, when I found him, was in a mental hospital, and I'm now today his caregiver. Oh. I'm not caregiver, but I take care of. I'm the uh, do you call it guardian? Yeah. Uh, for my brother. Yeah. Um, and I have a younger sister that lives in Washington State, and we connected, and we're, we had to go through all that experiences of trying to get to, to uh, know each other as siblings, and go through those real difficult discussions about whether or not our mother loved her, or she liked boys over girls. I mean, gosh, all those things that ran through. And I had no idea until I started looking further into that hospital and that, in that orphanage in the back of the campus. I, I guess I could stop for there right now. Can, I'd like to just ask you a couple questions then, Jim. Thank you so much for, for sharing. Uh, if you, I, this is a hard question, but, um, if you could think of two things that really impacted you in boarding school in your adult life <clears throat> as a result of having been separated and all those, that's a long time, 10 years. And I'm blown away at how you would get off an airplane and then somebody would just say, you're going here. I mean, can you imagine, I can't imagine you know, what that felt like or what it was like you have you couldn't make any decisions of your own your family made no decisions and your poor mother the threat of adoption or just the grief sense of powerlessness she must have felt but can you just share two things that you saw in your adulthood that were a direct result of what happened to you in boarding school well um what comes to mind immediately is um, uh, anger and shame. Mm. Um, that's that was one thing that uh, I had to work on myself uh, as a as a person to try to understand the why I was having such anger. I mean, mm. just absolute anger. Yeah. 
And the other thing, of course, is uh, seeing my anger, uh, how it affected my family and my children. And uh, I had to do a lot of apologizing uh, to them when they got older. And I still see um, things in their own personalities that I think were the direct result of my own experiences as a, as a parent, because I had no clue what, what it was like to be a parent. I had no right. father figure, no mother figure. And uh, thank goodness for Susan, she, she managed to keep them whole in spite of myself. Uh, I think uh, when I first uh, was eight years old, uh, when I went to boarding school and I left at 18, uh, I kind of checked out on my kids when they were that age because I didn't know, I didn't have a frame of reference of right. what it was like to be a father to these little guys. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, it kind of picked up again after they became adults, which is kind of weird mm -hmm. in a way because it was kind of like having me having to relearn and, uh, and introduce myself to them. That, I'm glad you brought that up. That makes complete sense, Jim. I had that very same experience. I was not able to connect with my daughter, my firstborn, um, until ooh, 10, 10 or later because of what happened to me in my adoptive home. And I uh, just couldn't. I, I remember thinking I should be able to do this. And you know, today, isn't it amazing, though, how we can heal and then have those full relationships. Um, and, you know, I don't like to say it's because it's our resilience, but it is because, you know, we shouldn't have to be resilient, right? We shouldn't have to do that. Um, and big, big, huge ups to your wife, Susan, to <laughs> hold it all together because having been through the, uh, that myself, I know what it takes to do that. So. But um, that makes that makes really good sense, and and it is amazing you were able to um, put that together and and give that to your children. You know, you gave them that um, that get huge gift of acknowledging what had happened, and that's a huge lesson then that they can share with, in the future as we continue to educate individuals. Where did you and Susan meet? Uh, of all places uh, in Seattle, Washington, uh, I was in the Navy at the time. Uh, I'm a Vietnam era veteran. And Susan was at one of those BIA relocation camps, I guess I call them. Uh, they were going to teach her how to survive in the city, how to get around, how to mm. get jobs, how to get training. And uh, I knew the person that operated the center because he had been a, an employee at Mount Ishkam High School. And those occasional times when I was able to call him and I'd say, who's new from Alaska? <laughs> and uh, he said, one of them was Susan Tabio. So I go, wow, I know her brother, Durante. <laughs> that was, so it was a cold call. <laughs> I think today they call it stalking. <laughs> <laughs> married almost 53 years now. That is amazing. That is so amazing. You guys beat all the odds. <laughs> I'm so happy for that for you guys. Um, so the other one other quick thing, and then we'll go to, to Dakota for a while, and then we'll talk together. Um, we're getting uh, really great feedback, by the way. Someone did say, um, thank you for your service, Jim. And um, people are really standing in solidarity with you as you as you share this. The um, going into the service, I I found that like when I went in, um, I'm a Navy veteran as well, and boot camp felt like I was not a piece of cake. But I remember distinctly um, them yelling and you know how they call you names and intimidate you and shame you out and all that but they couldn't hit, well, they didn't hit us. And I remember thinking, well, I'm not getting hit. Okay, I can do this. <laughs> so I think a lot of us who came out of an abusive situation, we were really 
uh, kind of prepared. We, we, we knew already how to ignore pain. <laughs> we knew how to put all our feelings down and just move forward, push forward. So we were kind of prepared in a way. So, so what, what did you do in the service? Uh, I took care of my uh, squadron's aircraft logs and records. Oh, wow. I, I served on an aircraft carrier as well, um, the USS Independence. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, like you, boot camp was a piece of cake because uh, after 10 years of boarding school, I'm saying, is this all you got? You know? <laughs> That's the exact phrase I said. Is this all you got? That's it. You're gonna you're gonna stop there. <laughs> oh shoot. Yeah, the only sad thing about my experiences back then, of course, is my younger brother who was that I spent all 10 years of boarding school with and uh, was killed in Vietnam. Oh dear. I'm sorry. Yeah, he had 41 days left and he was gonna come home. Uh, and he was only 18 years old. Mm. Well, for those of you who don't know, those uh, anytime that there is a a war, a conflict going on, the ones coming out of boot camp are the ones sent, and they're typically 18 and 19 years old. I was 19 when I went in. Um, they're the ones that are, you know, geared up up for that, and that's why you hear so many young people uh, in the service that are that you know died in 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 combat or it's because those coming out so that's pretty common but i was i was 19 as well and um the marines offered uh, an honor guard to escort my brother back to fairbanks mm. uh, but i can i talked my commanding officer into uh cutting orders for me to be my brother's honor guard mm. Wow. So I went to San Francisco, uh, Treasure Island, and picked him up and took him home. And it was kind of an interesting, surreal time because I was wearing my dress blues, and uh, and there was such an anti-Vietnam era yeah. that I was being hollered at, uh, cussed at, uh, yeah. being called a baby killer. Yeah. Uh, and and here they didn't know that I'm escorting my my brother home. Mm, yeah. Now we're trying to make up for that. You know, they're always saying, th especially think of Vietnam veteran. They have no idea what it was like for our men and our women to go over there and then see what was going on. They didn't know until they got, they were 19 years old coming out of boot camp. What they know, it was devastating for them. And yet there, there they were having to do it, it, there is no, no, I'm not going to do that when you're in the military. <laughs> it's just not happening. But um, anyway, let's uh, go on to Dakota. So we make sure we got enough time for everything. I got to be an evil timekeeper. Can you believe that? Um, but anyway, so Dakota, would you please um, talk with us? And uh, I love, you know, I retell your story on you <laughs> because you are such um, an example of of what it's like for us to come from outside to the inside. And um, if you could just share that process and then, uh, and how amazing that I often think of you, of where you were when we had that first phone call, right? And then where you are today, just being the full Dakota woman that you are, it's like, ah, or Lakota woman that you are just like, oh, it just goes to show you, this is who you were meant to be. This can't be taken from us. You know, once we reconnect, you become who you are meant to be. You know, so, all right. So talk to the people. <laughs> I, uh, thank you, Jim. It's really nice to hear your story. And it's good to be in the presence with you, Sandy. I, I know before this call started, I was telling her how much I miss her. Um, I do feel like, you know, it's funny, you know, looking back, I think about all the times when I was having thoughts and beliefs that just didn't mesh with the way I was being raised in my non-Indigenous family, um, which all made perfect sense once I found out I was Native. And um, it, was a, it was a funny journey. And I have to think, especially, like, I, was, I came from a really small town, 
like 400 people. And I went to the big city, which most of you probably wouldn't think was big, but for me, Sioux Falls, South Dakota was a big city. And uh, I was always scared, you know, that I was going to get conked on the head and taken away, you know, because a lot of fear mongering uh, happens. Um, I think it's happening today everywhere so that we can be very afraid of our fellow people instead of um, seeing them for other just other people <laughs> like we are. But anyway, uh, a native guy came up to me and said, uh, do you have any change? And uh, I panicked, of course, because I think I'm going to get conked in the head. So I said, uh, oh, you know, no, I don't. All my change is upstairs for my laundry. Oh, I'll go upstairs with you and get it. <laughs> I was like, uh, uh, no, that's OK. Uh, sorry, I can't help you today. Whatever I said, I don't remember exactly. And he said, your auntie would be ashamed of you. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm Norwegian, you know, like I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very light skinned and I was raised by a Norwegian family, but the seed was planted and my adoption agency was in um, Sioux Falls. So then I called them to see us, you know, at first I was like, I don't need to know names or anything. I just want to know, am I part native? And they said, yes, your mom was native. Your dad was white your math looks like you're three eighths native, five eighths white. So I was like, what a relief. I don't know why for me, that was such a relief. It was like a weight lifted off of me. And I went, and I called my mom. I said, mom, did you know I'm part native? And she said, I mean, just, I mean, what I'm going to talk about now shows the depth of, um, you know, like even in good people, because my mom is truly a good person, but the depth of enculturation to be prejudiced against Native people, and even as a Native person, how you can absorb that. So, so my mom is not Native, but when I told her, and I was so relieved, I was actually very happy, and she said, well, I knew, but you don't have to tell everyone. And then she said, uh, especially don't, don't tell Aunt Marlis for whatever reason, you know, that would have been the worst thing. I don't know why. So then, um, then she said, but now that you do know, uh, or if I said, well, why didn't you tell me? She goes, well, I mean, there's just so much, so many layers here. She goes, well, I didn't ever want you to think you could get a free ride. Yeah. And I, and, but then she said, <laughs> And I know I make my mom sound like a monster. She's not a monster, but you know, it's she's okay. Like, it's, she's she inculturated. Said she said. <laughs> yeah, she's inculturated in a certain way. And so then she says, but now that you do know, you could get your school paid for. So all of these assumptions about what it means to be native and what, uh, you know, and then I, um, she said, well, you know, and I wouldn't go looking for them because you're, I'm not sure what you're going to find. So, you know, pretty much all, you know, right there in this one conversation were all of these assumptions about what it meant to be native. Oh, and she also did said, well, the doctor told us you were white, so you're white. So this is kind of how my first uh, encounter was. And, you know, I went on, I don't, I don't know why, but I never really claimed my indigeneity because I felt like it wasn't fair because I didn't know much about it. But I, there was a real hungry hunger to know and um, I did a lot of traveling in my younger days after I found this out. Um, but it wasn't until I kind of got settled and I started having my family. I was living in Minneapolis that um, and I just really was in a place where I wanted to know more. And um, I called George McCauley. Oh, I called the uh, uh, American Indian Center in Minneapolis and I got George McCauley. <laughs> And um, he is Sandy's husband, mm -hmm. but I didn't know either of them at the time. And um, he said, I know exactly the person you, you need to talk to. And I, I don't remember if he gave me your number or if he gave you my number, but anyway, Sandy and I began talking. And, you know, just really, it was really 
a, a great thing. And up until that point, you know, the assumptions I made, right? Like that internalized racism, any place, any time I was with natives, I was looking like, am I dark enough? Uh, are my eyes as brown? My hair is not as straight, you know, just these kind of things. And I said, you know, I don't, I don't really know, Sandy. I'm like three ace. And she said, damn it, Dakota, claim your heritage. And I swore that, at you on the first call. <laughs> I, well, maybe not. Maybe I probably I'm, maybe, did. <laughs> maybe you did. I can't. I, I just remember that. You know, if, if you didn't swear at me, it was the emphasis. You know, like reclaim your heritage, and I felt so empowered and welcomed after that because I, you know, I was ashamed, like I wasn't native enough, and um, you know but I felt this calling and, you know, like now I tell my kids, I'm like, you're mixed. You don't ever know what ancestors will call to you, but my aunt, I, I really believe that my native ancestors always called to me. Otherwise I wouldn't have come back home on this journey. And so, yeah, um, yeah I guess I can stop for there, for there now, okay, but I started would, would this you... adoptees group um, and uh -huh. that helped me find my, family and it is you know what you mentioned earlier Sandy it's so scary to come back because of these things that I mentioned you know I'm not native enough I don't want to take advantage I don't want to take any money from people that are really suffering when I've had these advantages for being in a white world I have short hair you know there was all these things flying through my mind I didn't know anything I didn't know what smudging was even you know it, it was it was scary to come back but I just I really wanted to yeah and I still remember the first time that you walked into the to the church do you remember that do, would you mind sharing what you were feeling and what happened well which which thing in particular the, the first the, time or the time with the guy the, the first time the fake Indian guy the fake Indian guy share that that's your first time <laughs> I um, love this. This is because it's so, it just, it's everything that we've all felt. Yeah. You know. Yes, please do share it. Yeah. Uh, am I going to remember the order? But I, um, I'll I just fill was, in. yeah, fill in because I was just feeling very, um, you know, very awkward. I didn't want to say the wrong thing. I didn't want to out myself as not knowing anything, but I really didn't know anything about what it meant to be Native. Um, and I think I, I think we were talking, this one guy was there, he was super funny and he was talking on and on. And I think I went to the restroom or something and came back. But anyway, at, in a certain point, he was talking about, you know, what it meant to be a fake native. And I was, I was scared. They were talking about me, you know, I mean, I just really felt suddenly, you know, like that hot, the hot feeling you get in your back of your neck. And yeah. yeah, I mean, it really did take me a long time to come back because um, I, I didn't know or see where I could fit. Um, it, and, it would, and you were brave enough, at least. I, I just, 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 it was so incredible that you were able to say, are you guys talking about me? You know, and that's exactly what we did. We all laughed, but we didn't mean to laugh at her. <laughs> but we were like, no, this is us. We all, what had happened was we were at an event prior to that meeting. And this adoptee was saying that he was afraid to go out into intertribal dancing at a powwow because he thought people would say, that's a fake Indian. He don't know what he's doing. He has no business out there. And um so we were saying we should get a fake Indian t-shirt. Only us would know what that meant. And, and Dakota comes in the middle of that thinking we're talking about her, which is so <laughs> common when we're so afraid. We're so, and so um, we assured her, no, we're not talking about her. And, um, and then it was a really incredible when you were able to bring your aunt to the meeting. Yeah, like Jim. And a cousin. Yeah, well, I've got that whole family. I got like Jim. I don't know uh, if you, but once you reconnected, it was so, it was so nice. It, it was like it um, validated everything. You know, I had the paperwork and I had, you know, my blood quantum and I had all of that. But until I really found my family, it didn't 
and, and I was really well accepted in the adoptees group. Um, but once I found my family, I felt very, I don't know, grounded, validated, mm-hmm. grounded at home. Um, and anyway, so I had uh, an aunt that lived in Minneapolis. I, I had, uh, and then I had one aunt that came to live with me and I brought them both to the adoptees group. So uh, we all cried because we're criers. <clears throat> Can I tell family. that? Oh, I yeah. love, this is what I love. So Dakota would always cry every single meeting we had. She cried. <laughs> but I mean, I, I'm we a very all emotional say, person. Then, I am. And, and we would tell her, no, Dakota, this is our, this is important for us. This is, this is part of releasing pain and releasing, you know, and, and um, talked about how we all, you know, others of us had cried as well. And that crying is so important. And it's a sacred time of, of purging and releasing. And we'd smudge her down and smudge others down. But what was really amazing when her aunt came, they were telling, I can't remember if it was her aunt was telling the story or your cousin, somebody was talking, one of your relatives, and they all start crying. And I said, look, Dakota, you're just like your family. You come out the- you're all easy criers. And yeah, so there was a connection group. So something that she was ashamed of and exactly of who she was, um, was something that super common and made that kid so it's the littlest things an adoptee loses we we don't look like anyone we don't laugh like nobody says you laugh like your aunt gladys you walk like your uncle john um and it, it isn't until we hear those words too that that brings another healing and when you think about jim's experience very similar he didn't you know he he um they were, he was separated from his sibling. He was um, isolated. And so certainly he had others to look at, you know, in terms of, of him, but of what? Of institutionalism and, and nothing else. So he, he also, our boarding school survivors also have the same, same lack of our same emptiness and nothing put inside of it. But, but that maybe abuse or it, when we can get out, oftentimes we fall into um, drinking and to numb and drugs to numb. But so, so Dakota goes, so I just think of both of you, you know, Jim, you come from 10 years of institutionalism and I know you experienced abuse as well. You went through all of that and the service and then you become an educator. <laughs> You know, it's like, there you are, you know, being right in there in the academics and, and impacting um, young minds and, and using a remarkable gift, regardless of what they try to keep you from being able to use your mind. Dakota, you're curating right now, right? At the Denver Art Museum, Native Art, you know, and so... W- this it's so necessary to have these healing circles these hurling healing events there are our relatives today who still have not been able to make a connection or maybe have not even known that's what they need because we don't come out of these situations going okay now i need to go get help <laughs> you know we no. we don't know we need help yeah well so, if you were oh i'm sorry to no go ahead you I was Go just going to say, like, if you were taught in these boarding school ways, and if you were taught by Euro-American people, you know, in that culture, there's a real, um, you know, there is a real teaching to, you know, hold it together, uh, don't, you know, so seeking help, you know, you don't need anybody, there's like this fierce individualism, so even if you might think you need help, I'm sure by that time a hit would be drummed out of you anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I did want to say one thing and you know my grandma has passed but she was from the boarding school and she never went back to the reservation after that to live she did go back and forth Um, I don't know why if she didn't feel comfortable but there was severe alcoholism in that family so when I hear like your story Jim and I and I know the history of boarding schools I think well I'm guessing that set the trajectory for our family mm-hmm. after that too, for a lot mm-hmm. of abuse, a lot of, a lot of alcoholism. 
and we're yeah. still dealing with that. Yeah. You know, many members of our of my family are. Yeah. I want to come back to you, Dakota, but I want to ask Jim, um, what are you thinking of right now, Jim? Got some? Ref I know that you got some reflections and from what you've heard, and and I'd like to hear from you. Yeah. Um, there's so many things I could chat about. Um, when I was growing, growing up in the late 40s and early 50s, um, I experienced something that maybe is not as prevalent today, but I could be wrong. And that is uh, this, this thing uh, that my own relatives called me uh, was a half breed. And a half breed had a negative connotation when I was growing up and negatives uh, like uh, half breeds are dumb, half breeds mm -hmm. are weak. Wow. Half, you know, you don't know anything. And I'm ashamed to be even your relative, you know, that kind of thing. Wow. Those were really harsh times. And my father who was a white father died when I was very young. So I never got to know him or his French and uh, Irish uh, ancestry. Um, and I had, I had often had trouble fitting in, like I think Dakota mentions uh, about how do, you, how do you have a discussion about your family when you're, you're uh, in a mixed racial relationship kind of thing and your, your own relatives don't always, are not always embracing you. Uh, you know, those are really strange times. And also people, when they talk about their families, there's often a lot of joy and love and remembrance. And um, it was hard for me to share. I, I kind of like had to sneak away from that, those discussions because I felt uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up, Jim. That's an important thing to talk about. Tell us more. Well, um, there's another aspect of, of us as Native people up here anyway. I don't know if it exists on, in the lower 48, but um, we seem to be um, of two thoughts about getting an education. And so when we are growing up, a lot of my elders said, go to school, get an education, help your people. And so I do that, and then they, I hear things like, oh, so now you think you're better than I am, oh. or do you, you think you know it all now? Uh, shit, you can't even speak your language, you know, that kind of, those are all microaggression kind of things, and, yep. and I felt very conflicted <laughs> because, uh, you know, here I am, I think as human beings, we want to feel so connected to one another in so many different ways. And yet our circumstances puts us into these strange in, uh, environments that kind of makes us have to really think about our identity and how are we going to fit in. Uh, and uh, so I started resorting to humor uh, to try to deflect some of that, that stuff. For example, um, I'd often say about my dad, well, he was a white guy, but I, I never held it against him. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. You get used yeah. your old engine humor. <laughs> yeah, so I, I kind of did, did stuff like that. <laughs> That's um, a good, yeah. Yeah, and then this thing about uh, light skin, I um, obviously have lighter skin than my, than others up here and that was often a, another divider, uh, something that divided us, uh, even though it's, I had nothing to do with it, you know, that kind of thing. And yet I, was, I felt the brunt of some of that. Exactly. We learned all that ugliness in boarding school. We learned all that ugliness and thinking that that half-breed thing is just, nuts and I oh, hated that song that Cher came out with in the back in the day because that was like when I was what 9, 20 years old when that song came out and uh, it was like awful but anyway 
I'm glad that you brought all that up because coming back into community, this is what we face. It's a reality of our community, of an unhealed aspect of our community. The first time I'm talking to relatives on my first, um, and they were all happy that I came home. I mean, they were just, I've been very fortunate. And I remember um, we were at a softball game and there was drinking and stuff. And I was about seven years sober at that time. And um, I was sitting in a van drink and um, I think my Pepsi was, I emptied my Pepsi or, or I had drinking all my Pepsi and I um, opened the cooler to see if, there were, if they had any Pepsi, they didn't. And, and um, my uh, was my uncle and he, I said, uh, he says, hand me a beer. So I handed him a beer and I was kind of looking around and I thought, well, I guess there isn't. So I didn't say anything. I was just in my head thinking, oh, okay, well, there isn't anything here. I'll just wait. And maybe I got one in the car. I couldn't remember if there was one in the car that we had. So I just sat there and he goes, oh, so you don't drink, huh? And I'm going, nope. Goes, so you suppose you're going to start talking to me about not drinking, huh? And I said, wow, um, I didn't come all this way to talk with you about drinking. And besides, if I don't drink, there's that much more for you. And so it was like, you, yeah, you, you kind of rely on something. And, and in a way, having been kicked around and shuffled, you know, just in the way I grew up, I could usually stand up for myself in some way or fashion. We shouldn't have to. But he didn't. There's a part of him that doesn't know any better either. You know, I remember my uncle, even one of my other uncles even told me that. He said, you know, we, we grew up really rough. We grew up really harsh. And I said, well, I did too. And I understand it. I just said mine came through, you know, through adoption. And this, this light skin thing, like somehow none of that ever mattered to any of us until white people told us that when we experienced it in boarding school and when we still experience it today i will still get comments from people from time to time and so we have to you know stand strong and and um you know be part of that so i grew up in an all-white community i don't have exceptionally dark skin either but if you put me in with a lot of white people i certainly am darker you know, and I always say I might not have, uh, you know, what white people would always remember me, remind me I was Indian, even though I wasn't always thinking about it in the way that they did. And they would point it out all the time. And I, just, I, I don't get that. Everyone's been taught to be to be in that way. But that's a legacy from from boarding school. It's that hatred of self. The hatred Good. of our families and hatred of community. One time I read, and this this was also really meaningful to me, and I, I think it was in a book, and I can't remember which one right now, but it was, uh, you know, somebody that uh, was mixed race and was talking to their grandpa or something, and, and he said, well, which quarter of you is Indian then? Yeah. You know, the blood is flowing through the whole body, and that was, again, like one of those empowering comments yeah. to you. I don't think that I would have been I don't know. I mean, I don't want to sound, uh, you know, I don't want people to get the wrong idea. Like all natives are like mystical and whatever, but I really do believe that if I wasn't supposed to be here, I wouldn't have been here and on this journey. And so I just have to have confidence in that. And I also just really think um, that is, you know, one time an auntie of mine said, you know, there are so few resources that we learned to even separate our own people so we can get access to them. Mm -hmm. You know, like this lateral, this idea of lateral violence to hold each other down, you know, that is really coming from, you know, what you said, you know, like pitting, you know, this history of pitting us against each other and um, showing us like, you know, that there's a hierarchy when we might not have always operated in that way. Mm -mm. Uh, Jim, maybe you you can let me know if this is like an outlandish thought, but I want I when we think of who we are as a people, when we're when we are balanced and living within our values and our our worldview is a relational worldview, when we finally understand that and are actually walking in that, um, we no longer engage in destructive behavior. Um, however when we experience it and we know that it exists, I wonder if it came out of 
And we have to learn everything as human beings, right? Like if we didn't grow up and it shows it through our experiences, we're the only species that does not innately know how to keep our babies alive when they're born. Worms know how, fish, birds, you know, um, cockroaches, no, <laughs> bed bugs, lice. You know, I'm thinking of all what we think are lower life forms. There is no such thing as a lower life form in our worldview because we're supposed to all be related, right? And every, every life form has a reason on this earth. Well, anyway, if we, so that's what we would have been grown up. We were no better than anyone else, no further ahead, no below. We're all on the same. And that includes all the natural world. Then we're experiencing boarding school when I know that I've heard so many recounts of the punishment that holding one person down and everyone having to hit or making them through go through what my brother called the hotline, what others called the gauntlet, um, and everyone had to participate in hurting that individual. And if they didn't, then they were then hurt. They could not intervene and help ever or they were then hurt. That's a learned behavior that I see acted out in our communities. Find someone to pick on, you know, if he, yeah, and educated and better than everybody else, which, you know, or anything else. And then that person becomes a target and then people all jump on. That's a repeated behavior, just in a different scenario. Then does that make sense, Jim? Yep. Yeah. yeah, I was, I, uh, I was definitely, I had to go through the gauntlet many times myself as a, as a young child. Mm, um, I'm sorry. And the, who thinks um, of that? <laughs> you know, who comes up with that? What kind of person? For comes children, up with that? for little I, children. I saw children as young as five years old having to strip naked and having to run up and down the, um, the gauntlet. And we had children, other children on both their, each side of us with their belts, and they were told to hit us as hard as possible. And oftentimes we would have to run more than once uh, back and forth numerous times until some of us, our skin started bleeding. Yeah. Uh, I still remember that so, so clearly. <clears throat> yeah, I'm really sorry you experienced that, Jim. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm sorry, anybody experience that but even in our adoptees group you know we heard stories about two-year-olds being locked in boxes at night you know or and I think well I, I have a friend too who uh, kind of like you Jim and, and maybe like you Sandy too it seems like a lot of farmers would adopt Indian kids one to save them and two to have the the extra help mm -hmm. yeah but, they were free labor, yeah. Yeah, but and really, the, and the girls yeah. and boys were targeted for um, for sex as well. It was just anything and everything they could think of that they wanted to take from children. They did through that through that outing process. They called it when they put them on farms to work and and whatnot. But that then that then that shows us that we don't have any power. And then it, you know my um, adoptive experience was so similar in that then you for you lose your ability to think that you have power over your life and then you just become reactive to whatever is going on i'm drinking and i end up in this city okay so what am i doing now you've made no decisions you just respond and so much of that is because you didn't learn that you could make a plan and that you could put one thing in front of the other that's why it's remarkable that jim becomes a professor and is you know doing all of that it's like um, amazing. And just think of all the engineers and doctors and lawyers and researchers and all the minds that were missed in as a result of boarding school. I meet so many people our age. I'm 68, Jim's, you know, at that. I meet so many intelligent people, so intelligent, and still think that they have, don't have that you know, or that they did, so they didn't have the opportunity to go to school, you know, and uh, it's just, just, um, 
So for those of you who are listening, you're putting so many wonderful comments for those. Yeah, for those of you who are participants out there, thank you for all the comments you're putting in. And I want to ask the NABs people to make sure I want to be able to read these when we're done because I really haven't had the opportunity to read them. So um, I think um, um, I, I need to say that. Um, Jim and, and Dakota just are so appreciate you being able to be willing to, to share your life and to share your experience for people to hear two things. Once the reality of what isolation um, and violence does to an individual, and secondly, what our songs and ceremonies and healing do for us and bring us to who we were meant to be in in the in reality so there is hope anybody who is with us who has family uh, or uh, friends who are still struggling just remember to continue to pray for them use your tobacco use your corn pollen use your whatever medicine that you are given to use and continue to pray because miracles happen every day and miracles happen every day somebody will make a phone call and um or somebody will just walk into the understanding and realization that they're here for a purpose. Each and every one of us were placed here with a gift and a purpose in life. And our life is meant to be beautiful. Our life is meant to be um, fulfilling. And um, in a good, fulfilling, simple life is the best payback for all of that. <laughs> So I see Sam's face. Am I am I off time? Somebody tell me what's happening. What's going on? What am I doing now? Am I introducing you, Sam? Welcome, Dr. Torres. All right. For those of you uh, out there, we're going to switch gears when we say thank you to our, our panelists. And we're going to introduce you, Dr. Torres, who is the deputy CEO of um, the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, and he is going to talk with you, uh, share with you our study that our first of its kind study, uh, connecting um, boarding school and child removal through adoption and foster care. Take it away, Thank Sam. Thank you so much, Sandy. Glaso kamati miyak to you, uh, to Dakota, to, to Jim for, for being with us today in this incredible conversation. Um, I'd like to first uh, introduce myself to, to all of you in, in, I believe, Cyberland is what we were referring to it earlier. So uh, really grateful for also uh, uh, Jerry dearly opening us up in a good way. Um, so many thanks to everyone that has contributed to, to this event and, um, and, and the many others before it and the many others that will come after it. Uh, so, Tonalte no ikniwan na notoka Samuel Torres ni mexica iwan ni nawa, and uh, what I shared with you in in the, my language of Nawak, which I am it, still learning and reconnecting with um, as a result of the many layers of coloniality that 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 we have kind of discussed a little bit today was just uh, greetings relatives. My name is uh, Sam Torres, and I am mexica and Nawa. Um, I'm also Irish and, and Scottish on my mother's side, but most of my, my uh, relatives um, come from uh, Zacatecas, Mexico. Uh, most of my family right now, uh, well, my immediate family is currently resides in, um, in, in Los Angeles, um, in the East, East Los Angeles area. And I come to you today uh, sharing some insights and some of the work that we're doing um, on, on Dakota land um, here in the Twin Cities. Um, so as Sandy mentioned, I'm the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. Um, I uh, joined the team back in 2019 as the, the Director of Research and Programs, uh, where I had the opportunity to really jump in and, and dive in to talk about uh, this really important through line and continuum of forcible child removal uh, that that is shown within boarding schools and that connection to uh, uh, forced removal in, 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 in foster care and adoption. Um, so as Sandy mentioned, we have this, uh, this incredible first of its kind study where uh, we're seeking to examine, uh, of course, as it st states right there, child removal in native communities, um, looking at the correlation uh, ultimately between boarding schools, adoption and foster care 
um, again, in later generations. It's important for us to understand that um, that boarding schools, essentially, as Sandy likes to state, uh, was the first federal Indian child welfare policy. Um, this this policy of, of of taking children from their homes, uh, from their communities, from their lifeways, and placing them in unfamiliar territories um, is is something that has been charted before in boarding schools, uh, as we have seen. Um, so we're we're seeking to understand, uh, looking through those various experiences, those those powerful stories that have been entrusted to us. Um, looking at the impacts of, of course, intergenerational trauma, but perhaps most importantly, uh, charting the path of, of, of healing journeys. Um, I think as so often is discussed in um, issues like this in Indian country, often a deficit oriented focus is placed um, on, um, uh, on issues of, uh, of boarding schools and, um, and, and child welfare and adoption and foster care. Um, but we are really ultimately looking at examining uh, the wider picture, looking at how folks are healing from their experiences, looking at those journeys, um, not in a static dimension, but in a way that can allow us to gain deeper insights, how language, culture, and ceremony are, are, are being uh, seen as, in some ways, an antidote to this trauma, as an intergenerational impact uh, that continues to um, make its presence felt. Um, so if uh, those of you that are on the call today uh, feel called and compelled to support uh, this study, we are currently at 900 participants, which is uh, amazing. It's incredible how many stories over this time that this study has been in existence working with Sandy uh, as a principal investigator through the First Nations Repatriation Institute, as well as working with um, our, our, our partners and, and other principal investigators at the University of Minnesota. Uh, this has been a truly collaborative process, uh, this process that has brought together so many brilliant minds um, that has sought to engage in a uh, a decolonial process that though we are that we are working with folks at the University of Minnesota, they are so uh, deeply open and interested in and in, and in letting the the indigenous voice shine and lead and and to be able to provide those proper uh, uh, situated perspectives in a study of this kind and which is which those interpretations are essential for this type of work to happen. Uh, what's I think important to share with you all too at this time is that this this entire process has been guided by ceremony um, throughout the various stages of our um, of of our collaboration together. We have always recognized the the meaningful presence, the gift of these stories that have been shared with us. It's not easy. We understand. We recognize to share some of these stories. And we have a very firm uh, responsibility and, and, and a duty to, to, uh, to honor them. And so we have in various aspects and, and moments of our, of our study have engaged this in a deeply grounded way. Uh, we've held um, in-person ceremonies, virtual ceremonies, pipe ceremonies at, at various intersections of this study. And we will continue to do so as we understand that this, of course, is intellectual work, that, that it can be seen as academic work, but it is also deeply spiritual. And these stories are, 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 are those that we, we are hoping to be able to honor in profound ways. Mm -hmm. So you'll see the link that was just dropped there. If you feel called to, to either take the survey yourself or share uh, with a, a relative, uh, the, some of the qualifications, the, er, the immediate qualifications are if you're a boarding school survivor, uh, you have boarding school history in your family, or if you've ever been adopted or placed in foster care, um, we are, 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 are asking for your help, and, and we hope to be able to in include your voice in this. Uh, we are in no rush to publish our results. We want to take our time with this, and, and ultimately, we're thinking about putting together a, uh, a multi-fold approach for how we engage with folks, including with in-person gatherings, virtual gatherings, in order to be able to share some of our uh, our our emergent 
uh, results and outcomes. So uh, a lot more to come on this. We're looking to try to get around a thousand responses. And as you can see, we're very close to that, um, but it, it is an ongoing process right now. We look forward to sharing our results with you. So I, um, again, I'm grateful to be with you all today. I'm, I'm so deeply inspired by the voices that were shared to, in today's events. I think it's really important to keep in mind that these are not issues that are in the past. Of course, as we know, historical trauma and intergenerational trauma um, is with us, but we also understand that as intergenerational trauma is with us, um, that intergeneral, intergenerational healing is also um, with us is something that we have in our in our bloodlines. And um, so I want us to be mindful that um, as we walk through the rest of this academic year there are, or this 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 academic and calendar year, there's a lot of really incredible dates to, to be aware of. The Department of the Interior will be releasing the report on the Federal Boarding School Initiative here soon. Uh, we also need to make our voices heard regarding um, the Supreme Court's uh, on February 28th, the Supreme Court agreed to hear uh, uh, the case of the constitutionality of, of ICWA, which will be which will be um, heard later on in the year. So we need to make our voices heard uh, to to be able to, to 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 state loudly that we need ICWA and that we need to do more as well as we know that Native youth are are targeted more than any other. Um, ethnic and racial demographic for removal from their homes in the foster care system. Uh, so there is a lot that we can do. Please continue to stay in touch with us at the at the uh, the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. And I would like to offer a song to close us out. Um, so deeply inspired by our conversation today, um, we know that it's our languages, our songs, and our traditions that will um, help us heal from this intergenerational trauma. So if you have your medicines with you, I invite you to, uh, to, to hold them and to bring them near you. And um, I'd like to offer this song in Nahuatl that was taught to me by some of my teachers, uh, Senoch Quiros and Marianne Quiros um, in Calpuli Yasenoshli, who uh, we practice our, our ways together, though my family is in, uh, in Los Angeles and in Zacatecas and in El Paso right now, I know that our relatives find ourselves everywhere in all of the places. Uh, and so I'm grateful to share this with you. This song is reminiscent and reminds us of our mother, Tonantzin, Tonantzin Tlali, in Nahuatl that means our mother, our mother earth. And though we maybe in a place of reclaiming our languages in our songs, such as myself, we know that our mother has never forgotten who we are. And that as we came from this earth, we will also return to the earth. So this song is in honor of that.
Last book of Mati, thank you to everyone who joined us today. Please keep in touch with us. Our website is boardingschoolhealing.org. Uh, you can visit us there at any time. Uh, join us in this movement. We look forward to being with you again. Thank you and have a good rest of your day.